Hey everybody, and welcome to chapter one of Cognitive Psychology. We're talking about the science of the mind. Uh, I will be your guide for this uh, this adventure this semester, uh, and let's get into it. Before I start, though, I want to talk a little bit about the format of these videos and kind of what I have in mind uh, for them. So. Um, these are mostly the same slides that I use in my in-person class and the reason why I do that is because I really want to try to make our online class be as much as like what you would get if you were taking the class in person like I don't feel like you should have different learning outcomes or expectations just because you're taking it online so I try to make it as engaging as I would you know uh, in a typical kind of lecture format now with that being said this video is probably going to be in each chapter is probably going to be close to an hour long uh, which is a really long time to pay attention. So feel free to pause the video to take a break. I'll usually let you know when there are good times to take breaks. And then the final thing is that I've heard a lot of students in the past say that one of the ways they studied for this class is that they would like just listen to these videos while they went on a run or while they commuted to work or while they were um, uh, nursing their, their kids or whatever. So feel free to have me going in the background you know like it's it's okay you can you know don't feel like you have to pay your complete attention to all of this because you can always rewind if you need to you can always pause it if you need to um all right so with that said let's get into it so thank you so much for joining us in this chapter we're going to be talking about what cognitive psychology is where it came from and kind of what subjects we'll be studying uh this semester so how it is tested very exciting stuff. Uh, now, I love including videos in my in-person class, and I try to include these for you too, and so I'll be referencing these. Um, so, if you download the lecture slides, you'll see these links. If you click on them, it'll take you to a YouTube video uh, that kind of talks about uh, or, or demonstrates a cognitive phenomenon that we'll be focusing on in this chapter. Now, for this chapter, uh, a lot of this, what we're talking about is is kind of concepts and history, things that don't really lend themselves all that well to video. Uh, so I am using um, Darren Brown's Person Swap video. This is a very old video because this this television program came out before YouTube was even around, I believe. Uh, so the video quality is a little crummy, but it's really fun and it's really interesting and kind of shows how you can use some of the tricks of cognitive psychology whenever you are. Um, trying to mess with people in public and trying to pull pranks on people. That's because that's essentially what this is. Uh, but it's kind of a fun demonstration of something called change blindness, which we will be talking about later this semester. So let's get into it. We're talking about cognitive psychology. Now, cognitive psychology is new, and I should put quotation marks around new because it's really not that new. It's depending on where you want to define it, it's going to be in the 50s or 60s. Um, and the reason why I say depending on how you define it is because historiography is something that people argue about a lot and it's a topic that a lot of people find very boring. I find it thrilling and really interesting uh, and so that's why I have a senior capstone class called History and Systems of Psychology and it's a really fun class but it sounds really really boring. Uh, so I'm going to try to dial back the history stuff because you, you, you enrolled in this class to take cognitive psychology not take the history of cognitive psychology. But I do think it's important for us to kind of talk about where it came from. Um, and the reason for that is probably familiar to you because you're a psychologist in training, right? Uh, if you are a psych major, then you know one of the most important ways to kind of understand why somebody's doing something right now is to look at their past, right? Look at what their behavior like was like in the past. Look at what things influenced them. And that can tell us a lot about where things are now. So that's why I wanted to kind of focus on the history of cognitive psych um, uh, so that we can kind of answer what is cognitive psych. Uh, so I'm not going to give you a definition of what cognitive psychology is just yet. I'm going to kind of lay the, the, the basis for where it came from first. Uh, so cognitive psychology is, is this, this branch of psychology. Uh, much like, you know, you have social psychology, you have behavioral psychology, you have industrial organizational psychology, you have developmental psychology, you have um, um, cognitive neuroscience. You may have heard that before. It's cognitive psychology plus neuroscience. But this is a field that is still pretty new, came around in the 50s and 60s, and that's compared to, if you think of most other sciences, physics, chemistry, math, or even branches of those fields like 
quantum physics or um, Newtonian physics or, or whatever. Uh, all of those basically predate um, uh, cognitive psychology. It's, this is all you know, relatively new uh, in terms of science is go, you know, because psychology itself is still pretty new as well because we didn't really come around till the, the late half of the 19th century. Uh, so most fields of psychology, you're going to see a lot of these ideas that are kind of familiar. When we talk about things like memory or attention or language development or decision making, all of that stuff is cognitive psychology. It's usually just kind of packaged and kind of retooled under different branches. Um, so some of these ideas you may see, you may have seen in other classes already. Uh, now before cognitive psychology came around, uh, behaviorism was the name of the game. Behaviorism was the predominant branch of, uh, of psychology at the time. Before that, it would have probably been like psychoanalysis or something like that, that Freudian stuff that nobody likes these days. I shouldn't say that. People like that stuff these days, unfortunately. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to cast shade. <laughs> um, but I record these a little bit later in the evening where um, I feel a little bit uh, less guarded and, and more willing to kind of speak my mind about things like Freud. Uh, so early psychology, to give you a very quick crash course on this, in America there was two competing fields, there was functionalism and there was structuralism. Functionalism was essentially like um, being curious about why we do the things that we do and structuralism was interested in how we do the things that we do. And functionalism ultimately won that debate. Uh, and functionalism uh, won that debate in part because structuralism really depended on something called introspection. Introspection was essentially like you ask somebody, um, if I'm interested in kind of how you visually perceive the world, asking you, what is it that you see whenever I show you this right here? What is it that you see? Okay, what shape do you see? What colors do you see? Now, whenever you saw this first, what came to mind first, the shape or the color? Those types of questions would be kind of a form of introspection where I'm trying to understand what's going on in your mind by asking you these probing questions. But you can probably guess why that's not so good a method for research because it's subjective because if I'm saying, you know, like, oh, I saw color first, well, how can I be sure of that? How do you know I'm not lying to you? How do you know that I'm even sh confident in my own answer? So scientists didn't really like introspection, and that's part of the reason why functionalism won out. Functionalism then became behaviorism. Um, and that really kind of started with John Watson. John Watson is a fascinating figure in psychology, um, and he is known for the Baby Albert studies, if you're familiar with that from your developmental class or from your learning class. And basically, John Watson believed that any behavior that you couldn't directly see or measure were not really important in the systematic study of behavior. So if you can't see the behavior, then we shouldn't really focus too much about it. We should focus more, more on the explanations that come from things that we can directly see. Um, so, and this is a very extreme kind of position that Watson had. Not everybody who is a behaviorist feels this way. Uh, but John Watson felt like there wasn't really any kind of use or utility in studying emotion or consciousness or awareness because you can't see awareness. You can't see consciousness. Oh, my eyes are open? Does that mean that I'm conscious? I don't know. You've probably seen people that were sleeping with their eyes open, so you can't be sure that just because their eyes are open mean that they are conscious. So therefore, maybe we shouldn't study consciousness. Maybe if we want to be a science, we shouldn't be focusing on such abstract things that we can't directly see. Um, and behaviorism kind of followed that train of thought where it became all about the behaviors that you can directly observe, what we call explicit behaviors. Um, so that was kind of the, like I said, that was the name of the game from, I don't know, 1920s until the 1960s, let's say. Uh, so for a good 40 years, those behavioral, behaviorist uh, supremacy um, in kind of psychological thought. And, and maybe it wasn't supremacy because you had a lot of psychoanalysis going on too with psychiatry um, at the time. So before I give you a definition of what cognitive psychology is, I want to kind of look at three critical events that kind of get us to where we are today. And these are going to be three big events that happened in the 50s and 60s. So let's get into it. The history of cognitive psych. Now is a great time to take a pause, go grab a drink, go grab a snack, settle back, and we'll run through these over, I'm going to say, the next 20 minutes. All right, so pause it if you need to.
let's go. All right. So let's talk about the first point, which is um, growing beha- growing dissatisfaction with behaviorism. I started laughing a little bit because when I said let's go, I planned on actually shouting it and being loud. But I think that my wife is asleep in the next room, and I think she might get a little bit annoyed if for the second time this week she gets woken up because I just scream, let's go, uh, for no important reason. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about this first one, the growing dissatisfaction with behaviorism. So usually whenever I ask people, what do you think about John Watson's ideas about behavior? Usually most of the class, the majority of the class is going to say that they don't really like it, that they don't really like this de-emphasis on emotions, specifically emotions. And when I usually ask why, people will say, well, it's because emotions are important. They tell us about how we are feeling or why we do the things that we do. So we should include that in a systematic study of science and, or of, of, of behavior. Um, so John Watson felt like we shouldn't include that because if we want to be a hard science, if we want to be like biology and chemistry and physics, then we need to only focus on the things that we can directly measure, that we can directly see. Um, but that means that we can't really talk about thoughts or emotions in any kind of scientific way, if that's the case. So if you don't feel good about that kind of um, uh, mindset, um, which of course John Watson would object to the, the word mindset, um, if you don't really like that approach, you're not alone. A lot of other people didn't like it too in the public uh, because they felt like it was too cold and too robotic. And you see those words used a lot whenever people talk about um, what they don't like about B.F. Skinner or John Watson. And so you have these books and movies come out uh, around this time. Uh, like A Clockwork Orange, 1984, Brave New World. If you haven't read or watched those, um, uh, watched those movies or, or watched those bo- or read those books, um, now's a great time for you to do that. I feel like high, like late high school or actually right now in college is a great time to kind of wrestle with these novels that are yes, they are about characters, yes, they are about stories, but they're also about ideas and themes and about trying to hold a mirror up to our world so that we can kind of see our world a little bit more clearly by looking at this kind of exaggerated version of it. So these books, all of them take place in the future and they kind of look at here's what the future might be like if we start treating people like robots, if we start using classical conditioning to try to program people to behave a certain way, things like that. Um, so these books came out and they're really interesting. Some of them were turned into movies like uh, Clockwork Orange, very famously is a movie that is very provocative. I think it had an X rating, so you could not see it in theaters unless you were 18. Uh, so um, the public was starting to turn against behaviorism for, for these reasons. Uh, and I feel like that really kind of solidified with, uh, with B.F. Skinner ignoring the wrong critics. So, uh, and this is kind of, you know, like one of those stories that's kind of been hyped up and maybe was um, not as important as, as, as I'm going to make it sound, but I'm just trying to make it interesting for you. Uh, so after John Watson, he, uh, he ultimately fell from grace. Uh, he had a extramarital affair with his graduate student uh, and his wife left him, threw all the stuff out in the yard and he got kicked out of the university and went into advertising. Um, after that. All that's completely true. Um, so after John Watson uh, got kicked out of academia, uh, B.F. Skinner became kind of the figurehead for research in psychology and experimental psychology. And B.F. Skinner, I should say, I think he's awesome. I love B.F. Skinner. Sometimes people think that just because I'm a cognitive psychologist means that I don't like some of these old school behaviors guys. No, no, no. I love B.F. Skinner. I think he's great. And I'm not the only person uh, who does. There was a vote from the American Psychological Association. They sent out this questionnaire to hundreds upon hundreds of psychologists uh, and asked them who are the most important psychologists or most influential psychologists uh, of the 1900s and B.F. Skinner was number one. Not Freud. B.F. Skinner was. Uh, The top three were B.F. Skinner, um, um, oh, Oh, I can't think of his name. It's, he's the Swiss-Belgian guy. He's the developmental guy. Um, <laughs> this is so embarrassing that I can't remember. Uh, Piaget. Thank you. Piaget. Somebody, one of you said it, and I heard it. Thank you. Is Piaget was number two, and Freud was number three. Which is kind of interesting. You might not. not. So, P.F. Skinner, very, very important. Very, very influential guy. Still is, you know... Um, uh, or he passed away. He still he still is influential, even though uh, his legacy is influential, I should say. 
So a lot of critics of B.F. Skinner were really hung up on his explanations for language. They didn't feel like his explanations for how and why we speak and pick up languages was satisfactory. Uh, and because ultimately behaviorism, again, they feel like everything boils down to behaviors you can observe. Uh, and so um, think about classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, pos you know, negative punishment. Those ideas that you can use all of those concepts to explain all behavior. Um, and people were like, well, what about language? And B.F. Skinner gave an explanation and people weren't really satisfied with it because it's such a weird idea that language, every single human society has a spoken language. Every single one of them. And they all of, and we'll talk about this when we talk about language in chapter 10. Um, every single language has syntax, every single language has semantics, and every single language has phonology. And so there are some principles that every single language that's spoken by humans follow, no matter what part of the globe they are at. Um, so how does that happen? Um, that seems really weird. It doesn't seem like that could actually happen if everything is just conditioning, right? How does that mean that all these different cultures that are so far away from one another develop in much the same way? So B.F. Skinner gave his explanation. People weren't super satisfied with it. And so to finally kind of explain his case, he wrote this book called Verbal Behavior. And at the time, ver uh, Verbal Behavior, Skinner thought a lot of it. And he thought that this was going to be his best work and that everybody was probably going to know him for this book. Uh, but um, Noam Chomsky, uh, who at least at the time of, you know, uh, of, of me recording uh, this, um, is still with us. He's very, very old. Uh, but he uh, is a linguist um, and now known as kind of like a political writer and, and, and philosopher in some ways, uh, who works at MIT right down the road. Um, but this linguist, the most famous linguist in the entire world, when it comes to kind of explaining the mechanisms of language, Noam Chomsky, the number one guy in the entire world. Uh, and he wrote this utterly scathing review in a scientific journal for verbal behavior. And the public, both scientific and non-scientific, really were interested in, wow, what's B.F. Skinner going to say about this? Because Noam Chomsky just accused Skinner of not knowing what he was talking about and getting all this wrong. And um, people waited. They waited weeks, they waited months, and then ultimately people gave up. The B.F. Skinner never kind of formally, professionally rebutted the criticism that Noam Chomsky laid his way. He, he, and oh, honestly, he, he thought that Noam Chomsky didn't know what he was talking about, that Noam Chomsky misunderstood his book, so he didn't think that it was worth his time to even kind of address it. But the public assumed that B.F. Skinner was admitting defeat for that reason. But like I said, the truth is that Skinner just didn't take it seriously. And so the way that this was viewed by the public at the time is that the most influential psychologist of his day was wrong about this, and that that means that his explanations for how we speak must be something else, that there must be something else that explains that. It can't be all behavior can be accounted for using operant classical conditioning. Maybe language, for example. Um, all right, so that's going to be the first kind of prong where people are growing dissatisfied with behaviorism. Let's look at the second piece here. This is another one of those things where like, I could talk an hour about this. This is maybe one of the things that I, I assume some students think this is probably going to be the most boring two slides I'm going to talk about all semester. And if you don't think so, it'll be probably some of the slides to talk about in chapter three. Uh, <laughs> uh, so number two, the rise of computers. Um, so when we talk about computers in cognitive psychology, they come up a lot. And the reason for that is because cognitive psychology really kind of conceptualizes the human brain or the human mind as functioning like a piece of technology and like a piece of computing hardware. That we have input, we have processing, and we have output. That we input all of our sensory experiences, we process those things using kind of our cognitive processes, our mental thoughts, and then we output. We do a behavior that, um, uh, that we act on um, uh, that. So input processing, uh, output. So before computers, what was going on? Before computers, John Stuart Mill, who was a very famous philosopher, um, you, you may have even heard of because he's very influential in talking about democracy and, and things like that in, in the realms of philosophy. Um, 
and about how people and and how all people were created equal. Uh, that this philosopher uh, simple, uh, basically said, yeah, every single person who's born on Earth is born equally blank. That we don't really have any kind of personality. We don't really have any kind of biases. We're not racist whenever we are born. We're not prejudiced in any way when we are born. That all those kinds of personality traits or biases or prejudices or inclinations or talents, these are all things that kind of develop in in childhood or as we get older um, and uh, so basically he's saying that it's experience that contributes who we are that if you are a shy person that you weren't born a shy baby but that you were shy because of how you were treated whenever you were young or lessons that you learned when, we were, when you were young and so behaviorists really kind of adhere to this model this idea of tabula rasa what is tabula rasa? I keep saying this phrase with tabula rasa translates to blank slate like a chalkboard you know and so the idea was that we're born blank and then as we go on you kind of fill in your blank slate with all these experiences uh, as you get older uh, and then, you know, as technology became different, people started looking at other kinds of metaphors to explain human behavior. And this new metaphor, as you might guess, is going to be computers. But this isn't something that's just true for psychology. Uh, there's something called information theory. And information theory is this notion that everything can be considered a binary response of a yes or a no. This is how computers work, right? You, you probably know, like, computers, the internal language operates on zeros and ones, right? Um, and so we know that computers work because of information theory. Um, but other areas of psychology also, uh, or sorry, of science also absorbed this, this kind of information theory um, wave. Uh, this information revolution, really, that was coming in the 50s and 60s as computers were taking hold. If you talk about physics, if you talk about any kind of like, um, uh, if you talk about black holes, for example, when people talk about black holes, they talk about whether or not information can escape a black hole. And what they usually mean is, can atoms, can electrons, can quarks, can they escape a black hole's gravitational pull? But they call it information. Um, when you talk about DNA or genetics in biology, you talk about genetic information, right? So th this idea of information theory is not just psychology adopting it, it's l literally every single science, science incorporating it in their own kind of conceptualization of how things work. Psychology is no exception. So we start thinking about behavior as kind of like a computer where we have input processing and output. Um, and so in the digital age, like I mentioned, information theory revolutionized uh, every science. Uh, and so I should also say, uh, thanks Claude Shannon and Ada Loveless. Um, if you don't know Ada Loveless, now's a good time to pause, check her out. One of the most interesting Wikipedia articles ever, um, I think, because she's kind of like a pioneer in mathematics and kind of helped develop or invent the computer. And you probably never heard of it, right? Uh, all right, so, and that's why you should take my senior capstone, History and Systems of Psychology. So let's look at the third uh, reason here. We're talking about George Miller's magic numbers. George Miller, uh, not a super big name in psychology. And in fact, I feel like he's kind of a one-hit wonder. Sometimes in psychology, you get those. You get a one-hit wonder. Like you get um, Philip Zimbardo, for example. Philip Zimbardo, known for the Zimbardo prison experiments, right? One hit wonder. You know, like, uh, another researcher might be, uh, ooh, um, Von Restorff. Von Restorff was a German scientist. She developed this idea about memory, um, I think in the 70s or 80s. Uh, and um, that was kind of like the only thing that she really published that like, got big. Um, trying to think of another one hit wonder in psychology besides George Miller and Philip Zimbardo that you may know of. Um, I was going to say um, Stanley Milgram, but he's actually not a one hit wonder. He has other research that caught on to. I don't know. I'll think of some. Uh, the Amy Cuddy, the, uh, the psychologist recently who did the power pose TED talk, she's kind of a one hit wonder. Uh, that's kind of a complicated story though. Uh, all right, so here's George Miller. Um, he gave this landmark address that was later published immediately, uh, and it goes like this. He started out in this conference, just starting his, his lecture like this. 
My problem is that I've been persecuted by an integer for seven years. This number has followed me around, has intruded my most private data, has assaulted me from the pages of our most public journals. This number assumes a variety of disguises, being sometimes a little larger and sometimes a little smaller than usual, but never changing so much as to be unrecognizable. The persistence with which this number plagues me is far more than a random accident. There is, to quote a famous senator, a design behind it, some pattern to governing its appearances. Either there really is something unusual about the number, or else I am suffering from delusions of persecution. Now imagine if I started our class like that, right? You would be like, hold up, I gotta get this on TikTok. Or you know, like you would be like, I gotta record this, this is gonna be wild. Um, so, what, is, what in the world is George Miller talking about? George Miller is talking about uh, what he calls the magic number seven, plus or minus two. He's referring to our limits of short-term memory. Uh, so he asserted that memory has a very specific limit, and that limit is universal. That every single person has this limit of about seven objects that they can remember in their mind. And that that number is seven, but sometimes it can be a little bit less. It can go down to five, or it can be as high as nine. But that we can generally remember about seven things. So if I asked you to remember a phone number, uh, and I gave you this right here, we kind of chunked them together. If you had to, you could remember nine, one, two, three, three, four, one, two, eight, zero, right? But that's ten numbers which is kind of beyond the seven plus or minus two. So what do we do? We actually remember not 10 numbers, but we remember usually four numbers. We remember 912, 334, 1280. So that way we only need to remember four. And everybody can remember four things. Uh, so um, that's kind of George Miller, his big assertion. The really, the, one of the things that I find most fascinating about this, um, and to just try to give you context about why this article is important, is that George Miller presented some of it, this as like his own data, but he also looked at a lot of researchers that had published in recent years and said essentially like, yo, you thought that this was your explanation for why you were getting these results? Let me show you actually what your results were saying. Your, the reason why you got these results is because humans have a limitation to memory and it's seven items and you quiz them on ten and that's why they couldn't remember it. It's not because of your explanation about how time works or whatever. It's because we just have a limitation. So imagine how gutsy that is to just stand up in front of an entire room of PhDs and say, hey, your data is bad and here's why. It's because my explanation is better than yours. Um, that sounds really toxic, right? Um, I, just to pop back over to the other slide. Um, I used to uh, require this as reading in this class, but it's just it's a little bit too long and a little bit too dry uh, for me to, 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 to force you to read it. But if you're interested in this, I highly recommend it because it's an unconventional article. It's not the typical APA format of intro method results and discussion. It's kind of interesting for that reason. So it's long and it's not super scientifically written because again, he, he kind of gave it as a lecture. But it is one of the most widely cited articles in all of psychology. It's been cited thousands of times. There are thousands of papers out there that point to this specific article. Uh, all right, so um, why was this important in kind of us talking about where cognitive psychology came from? Because behaviorists really don't like to talk too much about these kind of internal limitations for things like memory. And the reason why is because it resides in what's called a black box. And a black box is a philosophical problem that is really hard to resolve. It's essentially this idea that we can't really see into our mind and what's going on in there. And so for that reason, we should treat every kind of explanation of what's going on in there with suspicion. Um, so ultimately, George Miller was like, hey, we've done this on so many different experiments, we keep finding that people can't remember using their short-term memory, which was not really a term that was used back then, so I'm kind of updating that language. You just call it a memory, but we would know this today as short-term memory, that short-term memory can't exceed, you know, nine items or whatever, uh, and that's just a human limitation. Um, so cognitive psychology's view is that if we can study these things indirectly, then we can learn about these new areas of study, like language and emotion and consciousness and attention. 
these things you can't directly measure. So the quote unquote cognitive revolution, which is what the book refers to it as, is this confluence of three events. The rise of information theory, George Miller getting people interested in, um, in asking new questions about psychology, and the negative public response to B.F. Skinner's verbal behaviorism, that growing dissatisfaction with behaviorism. Those three things started what became referred to as the Cognitive Revolution, which is a little bit of a silly way to call it because it, you know, I don't think there was any bloodshed over this, you know. Um, but people or psychologists started transitioning from asking these kind of strictly behavioral questions to start asking other kinds of things like about social phenomenon or about developmental phenomenon or, um, or about psycholinguistics and things like that. All right, so now is a very good time to pause it and to check back in um, after you have a little bit of a time to kind of let some of those ideas settle uh, because we are moving into the second half of our um, video. We're done talking about history. It's time to talk about what the heck cognitive psychology is. So let's define it now. This is the definition you can find in your book. I do not like this definition, uh, just to give you a spoiler. Uh, the science of how the mind is organized to produce intelligent thought and how it is realized in the brain. So why do I not like this? I don't like it because I, okay, well, what do you mean by the mind? What do you mean by intelligent? What do you mean by thought? What do you mean by organized? There's so much here that I'm just like, I don't, well, what do you mean by that? You know, like, so I actually like Wikipedia's definition for this. I think it's actually a little bit more accurate or a little bit more descriptive, uh, which is the study of mental processes such as attention, language use, memory, perception, problem solving, creativity, and thinking. So why I like this definition more is because, okay, it's the study, yes, it's the science, those, those mean the same thing, but here we're saying of mental processes. Okay, I know what mental processes are. I, I know what that is. So. Um, can you give me an example? Yes, I can. Like attention, language use, memory, perception. So if you look at just the book's definition, I still don't really kind of know what kinds of questions cognitive psychology is interested in, right? So when we talk about produce intelligent thought, I don't really think about memory as intelligent thought. I don't think about perception as to intelligent thought. I don't think about, um, well, I guess language use, I consider that intelligent. but. For that reason, I, I like the Wikipedia definition. Um, and another kind of shortcut of thinking about how or what cognitive psychology is interested in is that cognitive psychology is interested in how and why we do what we do. So why do we do the behaviors that we do and what kind of mechanisms internally allow us to do that? Um, behaviorists are really interested in understanding why behavior happens and using that to help predict behavior. but a lot of behaviors feel like we can't really ever understand the how or the, the, the mechanisms internally that allow those behaviors to exist. And that leads us to the black box problem, which I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago. So in order to kind of talk about the black box problem, um, here is uh, kind of, this is, and again, this is kind of a philosophical kind of thought um, experiment. So let's imagine that you have this machine. We're gonna call this machine the black box. And anytime we put a number into this black box is gonna give me numbers in return. So how can we know what that black box is doing to give us those numbers? So here is an example. I give it a four, a four goes into the machine and then it becomes a six. Okay, so what happened here? I can give you a couple of seconds to think about it. What do you think is going on in the black box? Oftentimes in class, people will say like, okay, maybe it's adding two. Okay, cool. So maybe when you put in a four, you get a six. Okay, uh, we could test that out, right? We could put in another four and see if it gives us six again. We could do that. Or we could put in another number and see what happens, right? But, and this is what the important kind of concept before I go any further, is that in this philosophical problem, we can never know what's in this box. So let's say for the sake of argument, there's no way that we can ever crack this open to see what's inside. So can we ever know, can we ever predict what this number is going to be? That is ultimately the difference between behaviorism and cognitive psychology. That behaviorism says that we can study kind of, you know, when we put things in, 
and how they change and then knowing that relationship now we that's what we need to know but cognitive psychology says that's important but we also want to try to estimate using these measurements what's going on in this box so that we can accurately predict what's coming out all right so let's say we put in the number one now now if you're if the rule that you had here you, that you thought that what was happening is that it was plus two then you would suspect if we add a one that should give us three but that is not what we see right we put in a one and it becomes negative nine that is a huge problem right because that's not plus two and or, you know so that's not what's going on here it must mean that something else is happening so now at this point you could if you want to throw your hands up and say i guess we can never know i can't open up that machine so we'll never know so it's just not worth studying but we do know that if we add a two and it's going to give us four and if we add a one it's going to give us negative nine but a cognitive psychologist would say, wait a second, let's keep adding some numbers and let's see what happens and see if we can figure out what's going in the black box. All right, so now we add in a zero. We add in a zero and that becomes negative 10. Okay, all right. So wait a second. So I, if I put in a two and that became a four, nope, sorry, that's not what happened. <laughs> I put in a 4 and it became a 6 and then I put in a 1 and it became a negative 9 huh and then if I put in a 0 and that became a negative 10 huh can we use that to figure out what's going on here you can if you take time you could probably use some algebra to do something like that you know to, to, to figure this out um, but I'm gonna be a little stinker here I'm gonna turn this sign to negative 4 so let's see what happens now. I'm going to throw in negative 4, put this in, and now it gives me 6. Not negative 6, but 6. That's going to help me out what I can figure out, what kind of I can deduce by looking at all of these iterations that we've tried. Is that probably what's going on here is negative, or sorry, is that number multiplied by that number minus 10. So if it is 1, it's 1 times 1 minus 10, which is going to be negative 9, which is what we got. If it's 0, it's 0 times 0 minus 10 equals negative 10, which is what we got. And if it's positive 4, it's positive 4 times 4, which is equal to uh, uh, 16 minus 10, which is going to be 6. Uh, so that, and again, if we do that with negative 4, we get 6 as well, because two negatives make a positive. So that idea that we can end, that we can kind of manipulate these variables and see how they are influenced and then draw conclusions about those mechanisms internally, that's cognitive psychology, folks. That's essentially what's happening. That's what we're going to be doing all semester. Uh, so we do this anytime we're doing any kind of neuroimaging. So neuroscience, whenever they are looking at the brain, and I should say that the re, you know. To, I just started like four separate thoughts. I need to go back and finish one. So to think about like um, in neuroscience, in neuroscience, whenever you're messing around with the brain, you can you can know what the brain is soaking in. You can know what it what inputs it has coming in. And you might know how what that person's behavior is like. But do you know what's going on in their brain? Right. You can't really see it. Right. Even if you have a if even if you have neuroimaging, it, you still can't really see what's happening in any given my in any given millisecond like that stuff is so imprecise still even today that it's still not even close to kind of giving us an accurate representation of what's going on in the brain at any given time um which is a scary truth to kind of think about um about how so much of what we know about neuroscience about that we still know so little about the brain but behaviorists see the brain as kind of like the ultimate black box that that black box up there we know that information comes in we know that information comes out but we can't directly see what's going on in the brain and so for behaviorists behaviorists don't really like to invoke the brain or the mind or consciousness in their explanations because they see that as being inside this black box that they can never open up and see directly so this is um uh, so behaviorists generally consider this kind of a deal breaker that this is unresolvable that it doesn't even really matter if we have te the technology to do it that just philosophically we can't see what's going on in the brain accurately and so we maybe shouldn't use explanations that involve the brain we can rely more on explanations of conditioning for uh, for us to do that instead um but today compared to in the 50s and 60s we have 
PET imaging, fMRI imaging, EEG, TMS, a lot of these ideas we'll talk about next chapter. And we also have better experimental methods too. A lot of those experimental methods we're borrowing from behavioral uh, behaviorists too. So here is a quick example of a cognitive psychology task. Uh, how we can use these kind of, how we can manipulate these variables and measure the results and draw conclusions about them. So this is a Sternberg search task. We're not going to talk too much about the Sternberg search task, uh, although if you were to go into graduate school in cognitive psych or experimental psych, you're probably going to talk about it. Uh, but basically the idea behind the Sternberg search task is that you're given um, an item uh, to name or to recognize and, that, and then you see a bunch of different pictures and you respond yes or no. Did you see it or did you not see it? Very, very simple, right? One of the things that the book emphasizes is that a lot of the questions that are used in cognitive psychology are very, very easy. And that's one of the reasons why we don't really use accuracy all that much as a dependent variable is because a lot of these things are easy to solve. But what we're interested in is how quickly can you solve them? Because understanding how long it takes for somebody to solve something might tell you if it is a hard thing to solve or an easy thing to solve, if it requires a lot of mental processing or not very much mental processing. So here's a very quick example of that, and I'll give you some iterations of this example. So this is an example of a Sternberg search task. It's actually from a 2018 article. Uh, I don't remember the name, I, I, I can't remember the exact name, it starts with an M. If you follow this link right here, it'll take you to the article where you can read it for free. Um, so I'm trying to cite my sources. Uh, so what you're looking at here is uh, search time. So how long it took someone to search a grid and say yes or no about a target they were looking for. Let's say that the target was the number six. So if you are adding distractors, other items in this grid, that share features like the number six, such as the number nine or the number eight or something like that, things that kind of look like the number six, maybe a G, um, that what happens is that as you increase the number of distractors on that screen, it takes them longer and longer and longer to say yes or no. If you give them, un if the six has a unique feature, so let's say that you have a six and all the other distractors are triangles like this that have no curves and you have this one target that you're looking for has a unique feature which is that it has a curve, um, it's going to pop out to you, right? Uh, and that's what we see here, that it doesn't matter that for those that shared unique features, it doesn't matter how many items you have on the screen. It could be 10, it could be 20, it could be 30. It doesn't really change how quickly people say yes or no they saw that, that number six. So using this, we can actually kind of make some inferences about how the mind works, right? What this means is that if we're searching for something that has that has a unique feature compared to the surrounding distractors that we're really, really good at tuning out and not paying attention to any of those distractors and just kind of focusing on a feature that quote unquote pops out at us. If we have a lot of features that are similar, that share features like those eights and those Gs and those nines, um, that we have to, that because it doesn't pop out at us, we have to kind of look at each of these distractors now, or we have to at least process them. And that causes us longer times before we can say yes or no. So this is, and, and that tells us about how the mind works. That tells us about how visual search works um, by just looking at this data, where we're looking at the input, which is the number of distractors, and we're looking at the output how quickly it took for us to say yes or no. So what we're doing here is we are systematically manipulating the independent variables, which would be the number of distractors, and we're measuring how much of a change there was in our dependent variables, which you can see here on the y-axis, um, which is that. By the way, very, very quick heads up on if you need a shortcut to remember the independent variable versus the dependent variable, almost always, not always, but almost always, the independent variable is going to be the x-axis and the y-axis uh, y is going to be the dependent variable. And oftentimes, if you see multiple lines, 
those different lines are also in, uh, an independent variable that has different levels. So here, the independent variable are the kinds of features. The kinds of features and the number of distractors are the two different independent variables in this study. Just as a quick heads up, because we're we'll talking a lot about research and trying to interpret graphs like this, it can be helpful to think about that. So here is a kind of an example. I want you to try to get a feel for how this thing is, is studied in the real world now, or in the laboratory, I should say. All you have to say is yes or no if you see this red number six. If this were real, like a cognitive test, what we would do is I would be measuring your accuracy and your reaction time, usually using a keyboard, because I want to, you know, I don't even want you to say yes, I just want you to hit a key so that it can be as fast as possible. But, and again, you don't have to say yes or no because you're probably in a private place and don't want to be a total weirdo by talking out loud. But I invite you to talk out loud if it makes this more fun. Uh, all right, so. The answer is no, right? We do not see the number six here. I'm going to increase the number of distractors as we go. So here we go. Okay, now you probably immediately said yes, right? Again, you probably immediately said yes. Probably immediately said no. 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 Yes. Yes. No. Okay, that was super easy. And that is actually essentially what this is, what this study is. And so why is it that you were very quickly able to say no? Because you didn't see that unique feature. You didn't see that red six, right? So, um, all right. So that's an example of the Sternberg search task to give you another example, a more modern example. Do you see this wary emoji and the following emojis? So again, you would say yes or no. This would be a no, this would be a yes, this would be a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. All right. So maybe you're like me. Whenever, whenever you were doing this, if you saw a lot of emojis, it took me a couple of seconds longer to kind of scan through it just to make sure it wasn't there, right? So that's an example of how whenever things share these features, that the number of distractors, as it increases, that so does uh, how long it takes for us to find it. All right, so we're kind of, we're getting close to the end here. Oh, actually, we are at the end. <laughs> awesome, uh, and this is actually great timing because my dog just showed up. I'm gonna introduce you to my dog in a second, but I wanna shout out a couple of videos. These are gonna come up uh, in chapter two. These videos I sometimes show to my in-person class, but not all of them. But I do think they're really, really interesting, especially these first two. They are going to talk about transcranial magnetic stimulation, which was a really kind of cutting edge, um, interesting research device, which temporarily deactivates the brain. That sounds weird, right? Uh, and then there is uh, an, another example um, that's like an hour long kind of way of like talking about, for this person, he uses TMS to kind of treat depression. Um, and anxiety and he talks a little bit about how to set up client with that it's really fascinating or it was fascinating to me I got sucked into it and it's an hour long I, I could have watched something I don't know like a good TV show you know instead I watched this YouTube video uh, anyways um, thanks for tuning in I'm going to introduce you to uh, my youngest dog whose name is Hopper um, he will probably cause mischief at the end of these videos but we're done early right it said it's gonna take an hour and it was before that, so let me show you how. Right. Come here. Come on. Sit up. Oh, where are you going? Oh, he's going under the table. He's going under the desk. All right. All right. He is. I think he's. He's. He still looks like a puppy, but he's mostly done growing. Uh, you can see he doesn't really like this too much. I think he's kind of uncomfortable, but he's so good and so, so chill usually that he'll tolerate it. Um, he really likes tummy rubs. He likes to play a lot because he's still very young. He is a, um, he's a mama's boy. Um, and uh, he, what else do you want to know about him? He, he what breed is he? We did a DNA test because he's a mutt. We just adopted him. Um, but he's like mostly German Shepherd and Chow Chow, which is a really kind of interesting mix. Anyways, um, throughout the semester, I'll introduce you to other dogs, <laughs> to whoever shows up. Maybe, maybe my wife will show up and I'll introduce you to her too. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. I will see you later. Thank you for tuning in and email me if you have any questions. Bye-bye.